Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. I have a wonderful episode for you today based on a wonderful and fascinating book that I came across, put out by Zero Books. It is called Jesus, A Life in Class Conflict, and it is written by James Crossley, based out of the UK, and Robert Miles, based out of Australia. I have them both on to discuss this wonderful work. In the first 30 minutes or so, we discuss historical materialism, the methodology of historical materialism as applied to the life of Jesus Christ, the fact that such an analysis has really never been done. While there have been Marxist attempts to sort of cover the topic of Jesus or engage with it, an actual thoroughgoing historical materialist analysis of the life and times and material conditions of Jesus, I'm not aware that one exists other than this book, which makes this book not only incredibly unique, but I think incredibly important. And I would love to see more sort of historical materialist analysis of major religious figures um, from different traditions as well. But this one was one I came across that I knew I had to have them on, and this discussion does not disappoint. So for the first 30 minutes or so, we discuss historical materialism, how they apply it uh, to, you know, deep history. This is ancient history. The, the, there's not historical sources like there are for World War I and World War II or whatever. It's much harder to try to, you know, to try to extract objective truth from, you know, deep, deep history. So we talk about the difficulties in that, the way that they approach those difficulties and try to solve them. We talk about the Gospels and um, whether or not they're sources of legitimate history or the differences between the Gospels um, when when it comes to historical um, sort of sourcing, etc. So that's the first 30 minutes. And then after that, we get into the the story itself from Jesus' childhood all the way through to his crucifixion and the legacy of the Jesus movement. We challenge a lot of people's presumptions about who Jesus was, what the Jesus movement was, um, what it was, what it was trying to accomplish. It is just a fascinating and deeply educational um, conversation, hopefully, but certainly book. Um, and and I absolutely loved it. So I'm very very excited to share this with you today. And as always, if you like what we do here at Rev Left Radio, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Rev Left Radio. In exchange for five dollars a month, you can get access to three bonus Patreon exclusive episodes every month and more, including the main way you can get a hold of me because as this podcast has grown, it's become more and more difficult psychologically and just practically for me to respond to everything. I don't like social media, so I'm not on there a lot. I don't check DMs. On Patreon, I do check every single comment left on every single post, and I try to respond to as many as possible um, on Patreon. So it's also not only a great way to get bonus content, but it's a great way to get a hold of me. And while I don't check every Patreon message, I do check every Patreon comment. And you also are allowed to ask questions for Patreon um, episodes, get early releases. I'm even thinking of maybe uploading some of the outlines I have for episodes so you can see the questions that I plan on asking, etc. Just try to give as much back as possible for those who financially support the show and make it possible. But for those who can't support the show, just liking and sharing the episode can do a great deal of, of, of help for us. And leaving positive reviews on your preferred podcast app is another great way to help the show. But without further ado, here's my conversation with James and Robert on their newest book, Jesus, A Life in Class Conflict. Enjoy. I'm James Crossley. I'm professor of, uh, well, I'm professor of things to do with religion and uh, history. Uh, I've got the two parts of what I do. One is I work on English, the English radical tradition from, well, from probably from the 14th century to the present. But the other half of me is I work on the historical Jesus. I've worked at the uh, University of Sheffield, University of St. Mary's, in London, and I currently work for the Centre for the Critical Study of Apocalyptic and Millenarian Movements and for MF in Oslo, Norway. Hi, I'm Robert Miles. I'm a Senior Lecturer in the New Testament at Wollaston Theological College, which is a college of the University of Divinity in Australia. Uh, my my write, writing mostly focuses on 
the historical formation of the early Jesus movement um, and the socioeconomic realities uh, within that context. Um, but I'm also very much interested in the life of uh, the Bible and religion in uh in 21st century uh, contexts, particularly within political contexts, and I suppose the life of the Bible within contemporary capitalism as well. Hmm. Well, it's a it's a real honor to have both of you here today. Um, as I was saying before we started recording, that this book feels like a book I've always wanted to exist and didn't know I wanted to exist until I came into contact with it. I find it absolutely fascinating. Um, we'll get into it, of course, but it really is a work of historical materialism, making sense of the life and times of Jesus Christ through the lens of Marxist historical materialism, which I think is is so you know, bountiful when it comes to what can be generated and the insights that can be sort of extracted from that analysis. So I'm really, really happy to have you both on. I loved the book. Again, the book is Jesus, A Life in Class Conflict, put out by Zero Books. Highly, highly, highly recommend any listener that's interested at all in historical materialism or in Jesus or in Christianity to check this book out. But let's go ahead and get into it with a sort of orienting question for, for both of you. Can you kind of talk about why you wanted to write this book and, and what you kind of hoped to achieve with it? I mean, me personally, I've been working on historical Jesus. I mean, it's really why I got into doing uh, doctoral work uh, and postdoctoral work was really all um, driven by the question of who Jesus was. Um, I. I've been working on historical Jesus questions probably for on and off in some way over the past at least 25 years, I think. Uh, and I, I've I've published some technical stuff over a long time. But my, my career has also gone in a different direction. It's related, I think. But I, 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 as I said in my introduction, I've, I also work on English political history as well. Uh, I But I've done a lot on historical Jesus and I continue to do quite a lot on the historical Jesus and what I hadn't felt I'd done is a proper life of Jesus and there were plenty of lives of Jesus out there but for me coming at this from a materialist perspective there was not really there's no real serious life of Jesus full-on life of Jesus from a materialist perspective there have been Marxists there have been anarchists there have been people with similarish kind of perspectives coming at the historical Jesus, but a full-on life, a full scholarly life of Jesus, I, I don't think um, properly existed. And I, and I wanted to do that, and I wanted to make sure uh, that, that that was done. So that that was, uh, and I've I've long been kind of interested in um, the English Marxist, the British Marxist tradition, and the uh, people like Eric Hobsbawm, Rodney Hilton, Christopher Hill, uh, E.P. Thompson, and people like this. And and th their focus obviously was on Britain and the transformation from feudalism to capitalism and what uh, may come next. And whilst there were uh, people who worked on the ancient world, some very good people who worked on the ancient world, it was never these the kinds of questions about the relationship between uh, a, f a figure like Jesus and Christian origins to the modes of production were not... They, they, there's work done there and there's some good work done there, uh, but not really a full blown analysis of uh, of a life in this kind of context and it's much more difficult to do this with the ancient world in some ways I mean we can uh, you can talk about feudalism and you can uh, you can talk about capitalism and, and you can make some pretty useful generalizations about what what those economic systems are but the ancient world it gets a bit messier and it's not quite as straightforward yeah I think a lot uh, the work of ancient historians, can contribute a lot to this and the relationship between individual figures and their economic context. So that's what that's what, what drove me uh, to 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 get involved and write a, uh, a book on the historical Jesus. I suspect Roberts aren't wholly dissimilar, uh, and the work we've both done overlaps pretty significantly in terms of our interests. But I better let Robert describe Robert's motivations. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think similarly lead to James. I've been working in, in the field for um, a number of years now, not quite as long as James, but uh, I first got into uh, the study of, of the Bible, ac the academic study of the Bible when I was at university, um, went through uh, and did my, my PhD. And it was actually during my PhD that I started to get uh, more and more interested in, in Marxism and historical materialist approaches. 
Um, but of course, my 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 focus discipline is New Testament, New Testament studies, and um, this discipline, I think, this academic discipline, it is like many modern academic disciplines shaped and uh, influenced sometimes in, in subtly and, and unknowingly ways by kind of bourgeois ideology or modern capitalist assumptions. Um, and of course, this is this is often a problem when you're you're looking at the ancient world where uh, this was not a, a capitalist society um, that these uh, events are purported to have taken place in. And so what I, what I uh, what a lot of my work, um, has focused on uh, is how um, is how to try and read across cultures, I suppose, and how to try and read across, uh, uh, to put it in Marxist terms, different modes of production, texts produced in an entirely different uh, social formation or, or mode of production. How do we do that? Um, in terms of historical Jesus research, uh, you know, uh, this has been going on for a couple hundred years, this investigation into, you know, what does the the, the sort of the earliest evidence say about um, who Jesus, uh, the the person, the the historical figure um, who walked, talked, and breathed in first century Palestine was. Who was that person? And there's a, there's been a lot of you know technical arguments and a huge body of research, and it's also a very contentious discipline. But as as James was saying, um, it, 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 no historical materialist. Uh, uh, view of this that's written by by um, you know scholars like ourselves who are pretty well immersed within this field um, and this body of research um, uh, yet exists I, not quite in the format that that we've uh, put together in this book Jesus a life and class conflict um, and one of the severe limitations and I think you know this really gets at the point about why did we want to write this book um, is that uh, Historical Jesus research tends to adopt the the great man view of history. So uh, the idea that you know um, historical change is generated by um, uh, uh, the singular genius of innovative great um, individuals, or entrepreneurs perhaps, uh, entrepreneurs of thought, thought leaders, and whatever. And, and Jesus seems to continually being uh, have been cast in this in this light within academic historical. Uh, critical research on the historical Jesus. Uh, whereas, you know, we're wanting to turn this on its head by drawing on the tools of historical materialism to say that, well, great men are but the products of uh, the social conditions that were built, you know, both before and during their lifetimes. They are, they may be conduits for, for popular movements and so on, but um, historical change doesn't just happen simply by the individual exploits of great men. Um, and so we wanted to really, you know, bro broaden our lens and to try and understand uh, the historical Jesus as um, both a, a product of the class conflicts of his time and um, and also to take view of the, the wider the wider popular movement, what we call the early Jesus movement that um, he was a part of. And that would have also shaped him and his own ideas and teachings. Mm. Yeah, so so this is an incredibly unique book in that it's the first attempt to apply Marxist historical materialism to the full life of Jesus, even though other Marxists have attempted to, you know, use Marxist methodologies to approach the subject. But that's why I found this book incredibly unique and interesting, and that's what both of you are, are saying in your own ways. And of course, the great man of theory, as many of my listener great man theory of, of history, as many of my listeners will know, is the sort of you know, error is is the the thing that is solved by a, a more robust historical materialism, and there are few people in the history, if if anyone, that that plays into the great man theory more than Jesus Christ. I mean, we can talk about certain political figures like a Hitler or something, and some people will have a little easier a, a job, sort of attempting to make sense of like, oh, if Hitler didn't exist, the Nazi movement as a whole probably still would have. It just wouldn't have been a different figure. But Jesus stands even above the most you know, notorious um, political figures in history as a sort of divine figure. And that I think pushes people in the direction of great man theory even more. But what you guys do is situate Jesus as a product of his material conditions and situate him in the, not only the material conditions, but the active movements and class conflicts of his time, which is so, so fascinating. 
So let me let me go ahead and ask you this, because given that this work is a work of historical materialism, it's obviously important to try and grasp Jesus as an actually existing historical figure, but that in and of itself can be difficult and even controversial. Um, so, you know, some atheists, for example, will claim that Jesus didn't even exist. There was no historical figure um, named Jesus, and it was just an amalgamation created after him. Um, and, you know, other people will make other claims about whether or not he existed. So did he even exist, and how do we know? Well, this is, this. yes, is the short answer to that. <laughs> uh, the longer answer is it's, it's complicated. The, um, within mainstream biblical studies, I mean, it's it's pretty much accepted that Jesus existed. When you get to the certain challenges, uh, and I don't mean this necessarily derogatory, derogatorily, derogatory, whatever, uh, that uh, more to the fringes you do get some challenges to this idea. But the main kind of conferences, journals and things like this, uh, this is usually um, the standard working uh, assumption. And it is an assumption in some ways. And the problem is, is I think scholars over many decades get used to the the idea that you know you no longer have to justify why uh this figure exists because you kind of all assume it and and sometimes scholars get uh, some fair and unfair criticism for uh, uh, having this kind of view from uh outside and online and things like this but it is quite helpful i think to go back to basics and explain what you mean by the historical jesus and what scholars typically mean by the historical Jesus is this figure who walked, was active, did what he did in Galilee and Judea, you know, in the, somewhere around the year 30, as distinct from the presentations of him in the Gospels and the early Christian proclamation of him. So sometimes, and this has been criticised, but I, I still think it's a useful distinction to make. The distinction is made between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Now, this can break down and can be, you know, people try to make it a com- more complex thing and all this, but it's a very it's a useful working way of thinking about it. And scholars will differ uh, in the level of the Jesus of history that they think could be reconstructed from pretty, um, you know, the Gospels tell us all sorts of useful information and we can reconstruct something like a, a stylish version of his, his his teaching as an adult and so on and so forth through to the more sceptical ideas that you know the gospels have worked over this stuff so heavily that we can't know very much um i think it's you know, the cha- some of the challenges from outside to uh, questions of history have been interesting because i think like, like i said just before it can help you reframe and rethink these things and 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 then for me when i work on other areas of history and particularly more modern areas of history and when i see the levels of uncertainty with far more data it made me a lot more skeptical about what we can know about the historical figure of jesus or, or maybe brought out some of my assumptions more and I, I i some scholars have developed criteria for trying to establish whether this saying or this act was happened or didn't happen and things like this but it's it's really it's it's almost impossible in many cases to say um whether this or that uh, same event or whatever happened. I mean, the best we can do is get behind, is to think what were the sort of ideas that predated the Gospels that were particular to Galilee and Judea uh, around that time that, that were different from the emerging Christian movement. And I think we can do this in, a, in, a, in, in several instances. We can talk about broad themes that were early, and that's and, and it, it's actually quite helpful. I, I'm, I'm not a complete skeptic in this sense. I just think we, in, I'm, I'm skeptical in the sense I don't think we can ultimately prove a lot of the details. I mean, I don't think we can disprove a lot of the detail either. So I would say things like um, the his, the earliest perceptions of Jesus, the earliest material we have about Jesus would involve, for instance. Uh, uh, ideas that this figure was a, a, an interpreter of the details of Jewish law uh, and Jewish purity law, which we didn't, a lot of which didn't have really any interest for this emerging Christian movement that was concerned with non Jews uh, or Gentiles. But, but it's, it, and, and it's material that's often particular to Galilee and Judea. So whether Jesus engaged with Pharisees over details of hand washing, all the details of the Sabbath, it's certainly possible, plausible. I can't prove it, but I could, I think I'd be much more confident saying 
we have the earliest material we have about Jesus involves questions of the details of uh, how you observe the Sabbath or how you wash your hands before uh, or should you wash your hands before meals and things like this. So I think we can uh, we can make well, we've got to work in, in terms of generalizations and and there are other things such as the idea of um, and we might come on to this the idea of rich people repenting and turning from their ways. Uh, a, a lot of this is about returning to the commandments, uh, to the Jewish commandments, and engaging in social justice in ways that were not always obvious to uh, for a new movement that's trying to encourage non-Jews, and uh, where it's not about necessarily about a return to the commandments; it's about uh, other ideas about uh, changing your ways. That's a bit vague, but I'm, my my basic point is that we can we have to talk about themes. Uh, and what are the earliest themes that are associated with Jesus? And this is why I think it's also doubly helpful because it gets us away again from the great man theory that these, this is not this might not the earliest material might not come from Jesus, but it could come from the kind of movement around him. It's a product of the movement around him. Is it a product of, for instance, uh, and I think we can do a bit of this, the uh, agrarian Galilean world, the Galilean peasantry. Does this stuff make sense in that kind of context, as distinct from, say, some of the uh, material from Paul, uh, some of which comes from urban settings and things like this? And so, it, it, it's those kinds of it. So we, we we can talk more generally about uh, communities and people or, or Jesus movement as we as we keep using the phrase. Robert, yeah, I think just to just to reaffirm what James is saying. Um, and then to add something to it, I think, yes, uh, that's absolutely right that, you know, in, in our book, uh, we, we're, we're skeptical about what we can know about the historical Jesus with confidence. Um, however, we're focused on, you know, what we're or arguing for, what were the, the earliest themes and ideas that can be associated with him and his movement? And we've got certain uh, arguments and, and, and ways of getting back to that um, early material, some of which James has, has kind of outlined there, hopefully. Um, but I think also it, it does raise, again, another, a, a broader question uh, to do with um, uh, class and class conflict and, and historical materialism and this kind of approach to, to doing historical analysis. And that's really to ha uh, how we talk about um, non-elite figures through history. Uh, particularly in ancient history uh, or kind of the, the pre-modern period where so few sources um, or evidence of the lives of the non-elite actually exist in history compared to, you know, the lives of kings and queens and um, uh, great leaders and so on. That um, and, and given that kind of dearth of, of uh, um, uh, evidence that we have or the, the data that we have, uh, generally speaking, for the lives of non-elite people, you know, how do we actually reconstruct their lives? We have to ask some some pretty serious methodological questions about this. Otherwise, we risk uh, erasing the non-elite from history altogether. I mean, that really is a serious risk that if we say, well, you know, there isn't enough evidence for these non-elite figures through history, uh, whoever we may be talking about, um, does that mean that they didn't exist? And I think um, uh, we just need maybe um, my view is we need you know a little bit of of methodological humility when it comes to talking about non elite people in, in history. Yes, of course we don't we're not going to have the same kind of uh, uh, evidence and 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 um, be able to come to the same kind of more certain conclusions that we might be able to about certain elite figures. Um, but that doesn't mean non existence, right? And, uh, you know, to talk about Jesus specifically, I think we actually have quite a lot of good evidence for uh, a, uh, a non-elite person of, of his time and place. And I think that is itself interesting and warrants investigation. And, and that's really what gets me interested in this whole area. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating stuff. And of course, you know, the Gospels play an essential part in trying to understand the life of Jesus. I think if you ask an average Christian, you know, how do we go back and try to understand Jesus and his story and his time and place, many of them would point immediately or at least think immediately, oh, the Gospels, of course. But they themselves have, as you guys point out, inconsistencies. They were written by different people at different times. They rely on different sources, etc. So how should we understand and relate to the Gospels as sources of historical events? And what important differences exist between the Gospels and their authors? 
yeah, this is this is the heart of the issue of trying to reconstruct who the historical Jesus is, and uh, or what we would call, say, the earliest material about him. There's, um, I mean, I've got a fairly traditional view, uh, and I think I, I probably speak for both of us here, in that John's Gospel is less useful than the other Gospels for reconstructing the historical Jesus. There has been some attempts to to rescue John's Gospel. I think it often comes from a place of driven by conservative Christianity, which is fine, but it could also be wrong. And um, But the, the reasons are, uh, and I think it reflects later ideas about Jesus from the end of the first century, maybe the turn of the second century. So we get in John 5 and John 10, these stories about Jesus claiming he's equal with God and the opponents who are called the Jews or translated as the Jews in um, most English translations want to kill him for it. And this looks like it's later Christian polemic trying to justify developing high ideas about Jesus that were not there in the other Gospels, in Matthew, Mark and Luke. And if if these ideas were earlier, why would they have been left out? And the simplest explanation is that they're developed later by figures like uh, the people or person responsible for John's Gospel. So the the best sources tend to be well, almost always are, come from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and these are called the Synoptic Gospels because uh, they they clearly there is clear literary dependence between them. The, uh, Mark's Gospel is almost certainly the earliest gospel, and then there's theories about uh, what other sources might be behind it. The most common one is that there is an an in, uh, more or less an independent source that gets labelled Q. Uh, a shorthand, whether this is a lost gospel or um, a shorthand for disparate sources, depends on the scholar. So um, the standard model would be that there's Mark and there's Q as the two main earlier sources, and Matthew and Luke use them. There are challenges to this theory, but the standard one is that Mark, uh, that Mark is the earliest, is pretty much widely ex- uh, accepted by critical scholars today, and so. Um, I mean, we more or less take on something like the model of Mark and Q as the two earliest sources, with independent sources feeding into Matthew and Luke as well. So we, this can be quite useful when you start looking at themes, topics, issues that occur independently, say something, um, you might get the theme of uh, the reversal of rich and poor in Mark's gospel. You might get uh, the uh, uh, another theme of the reversal of rich and poor in a Q or independent source, which are the, the two different stories, but they've, they've got the same kind of ideas going on. So that might point to um, an independent theme that predated the Gospels. Now, there's a lot more work that has to go into it, but that's the kind of things you can do. Or again, to go back to the question of law and purity and things like this, we get stories about law and purity and independent sources, some of which have got, I think, some fairly obvious Aramaic backgrounds to them, little bits and pieces. And so you can collectively start bringing these sources, these little bits and pieces together. You can see where do they make sense, where might they have originated from, uh, and then try to explain how they got into the Gospels and things like this. But the key thing is you can start using these to reconstruct bits and pieces of themes and details that predated the Gospels themselves and were inherited by Mark, by Matthew, and by Luke. So it, it 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 often has to be done on a case by case basis or a theme. I prefer a thematic basis. So you might look at a text in Mark's gospel and a comparable text in Luke's gospel or whatever, and try to explain how these um, seemingly obscure themes come to be uh, be in the gospels. And some of the time is simply because they're early themes that resonated in uh, Galilee, and they were not going to get rid of them in a hurry because they're associated with Jesus. And then they have to be reworked and developed and made, uh, made sense of for a new and emerging audiences for the gospel writers. But you also said something that was good, was quite important, I think, is that um, we have four gospels. We can guess where they were written. We can make some guesses about authorship. But, I mean, even some of the best guesses about authorship, are pro- I mean, take Mark's gospel, for instance, I I. I I don't know who wrote Mark's Gospel. Um, some people think he was a figure called Mark, and we don't really know that much about that figure anyway. Um, the two best guesses for where Mark was written are, are Rome 
on the one hand and Syria or, or Galilee on the other. I mean, they're two quite different parts of the world. And you realise how much speculation there is about about the sources themselves. So, we, we, I mean, it's pretty good considering it's the ancient world, the sources we've got. But anyone who's familiar working with uh, more recent history, if medieval history, you, um, but certainly modern history, obviously, yeah, the, the, we just don't have the level of material to do a full-on biography in, in the modern sense. Robert, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I think um, just one thing I'd like to add is that uh, some of the... the... Um, more recent scholarship on on the Gospels themselves has been focused on the genre of the Gospels, and um, you know it, I think sometimes some uh, Christians, uh, perhaps of a more conservative bent, will just assume that the Gospels are kind of like newspaper reports of the events or, or what have you. Um, uh, but I think that's to kind of mis genre mis genre the the, uh, the 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 Gospels themselves, which. Uh, scholars have said um, are um, appear to be very similar or quite like a, a form of Greco-Roman biography, which uh, were themselves kind of the ancient versions of of great man presentations. So um, they tend these sorts of writings tend to adhere to certain literary conventions that, um, although you know, are very interested in in uh, depicting. Their, their figures within uh, certain events and so on um, uh, tend not to be so interested in um, putting them in correct chronolog- uh, chronological order, for example, or uh, but also that they um, they often accentuate you know the individual importance of these figures as as great men. So in order to uh, do this historical materialist reading or this uh, kind of history from below, we have to actually um, you know, really account for that uh, that genre of of the gospels themselves and the way in which that shapes the the material that that they're presenting. Um, you know, added into that is that these gospels are uh, are kind of written after the fact when um, you know Christianity is already becoming this movement spreading around the Roman Empire, and they are very much concerned with uh, proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, the the, they're caught up in in um, the the you know the, uh, the grand theological claims that are being made by the movement and presenting the life of Jesus in a way that um, that you know gives context and background to those claims. Um, so we we it, it it it's not an easy task to to you know figure out uh, uh, what material um, uh, kind of would be. You know, strictly historical in the sense that we're talking about of of going back um, to some of the earliest themes associated with the early Jesus movement. Yeah, so that genre point is really important. Let me go ahead and kind of summarize some of the stuff that, that both of you said, and let me know if I, I get this more or less right. Um, chronologically speaking, the Gospel of Mark seems closest to the actual events in question, and then there's this other source. Uh, independent source that is labeled Q um, that are kind of, you know, the the main sources from which then Luke and Matthew chronologically after Mark draw from to create their gospels, which are very, you know, sort of similar in various ways. And then it seems that a period of time passes. And then there's the gospel of John, which is much more um, perhaps, uh, you know, religious, less historical based. There's more ideology perhaps coming into it. And so that makes John perhaps, If we're going to rank them slightly less reliable than the other ones, Mark slightly more reliable. And of course, you're also triangulating with whatever other historical sources you can find. So I believe uh, Josephus, um, I think he's a Roman historian, correct me if I'm wrong, but he seems to be outside of the Christian movement, outside of the Jesus movement, commenting on it as well. And so you can kind of use that as another source. Is is that more or less correct? Yeah, I I, I think that is the the broad outline is correct. I think... um... The, I've made a couple of qualifications. One is Josephus may have a report of Jesus. Uh, this is the extent of which is disputed. Um, but even so, I, I think Josephus is of minimal use for the historical Jesus himself because, uh, like with Roman, uh, with Tacitus or someone, a Roman historian who mentions the movement, the movement already exists at this point and it's just a report in some ways on who this founding figure was. 
So um, it, it, it's not of any particular use in ex, it, no additional use for material or anything like that. I don't think. Um, quite when the I mean, it, it's possible, for instance, that John's Gospel was written close in time to Luke's Gospel, for instance. And I still, and I, uh, he, he, I could, you could still make the argument. I think that Luke retains more material of use for understanding the historical Jesus. John, um, I. I, I, pro- I would be hesitant to use the words. I'd, no, I would not be hesitant to use the word ideology, um, or, or more. Uh, I would be hesitant to use the word more religious. What I would say is they're all ideological. It's just that um, one's early ideology, one's later ideology, okay. if I can put it that way. So it's a chronological thing, in a way. So the rare have got their own religious concerns, as did Jesus, but John reflects later ideological and religious concerns than the others or to put it another way we are more likely to get the earlier ideological and religious concerns from matthew uh, mark and luke um but i but really i mean I, I'm, I'm quibbling with details there the gist of what you say is 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 pretty much right okay Wonderful. Yeah, that's that's incredibly interesting. And now we've sort of gotten the context and the methodology taken care of. We understand that this is a work of historical materialism. We grappled with some of the difficulties of trying to find good historical sources uh, going that far back. We've talked about the Gospels. So now let's get into the basically the story itself, the, 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 the bulk of the book, which is Jesus, his movement, and the conditions in first century Palestine. So let's start with this question. What mode of production existed in Jesus' time? What were the major classes, the dominant political structures, and how was class conflict sort of manifesting at this time? Mode of production is is a, is a, is a, is a quite difficult question when it comes to the ancient world, um, uh, especially when you go to the Eastern Mediterranean because it's not all quite uh, uh, developed in the same way as other parts of the Mediterranean, for instance. Uh, a strong case can be made for the uh, the sustained use of slavery and slavery being a dominant mode of production. I think this is entangled with other important developing modes of production. So I'm not sure if we can always talk about an overarching one that explains everything. These things develop in, in different times and contexts and settings. But I think what we can say with a bit more certainty is in in... Galilee, Judea, in the Eastern Mediterranean, you have a model where the, and and put this crudely, but it's a useful working model, where the aristocrats in the towns, in the urban centres, extract surplus from the countryside. And that's pretty normal and had been for some time, so why would it make things different? Well, what you happen, what is happening in Galilee, and uh, we'll come to Judea in a minute, but what's happening in Galilee where Jesus was born and raised is that there were two major urban developments as he's growing up so the just up the road an hour's walk away was Sepphoris which was raised to the ground around the time Jesus would have been born um, and rebuilt and up towards the Sea of Galilee was Tiberius and these urban centres extract resources from the countryside to be built there was a bit of a debate, and it's 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 a very misguided debate, and uh, and I think it's been pretty badly framed in many ways in historical Jesus studies and in studies of Galilee. It's about the standard of living. I mean, as that you get uh, some histo- some historians will say some really kind of I think kind of really careless things about saying uh, there was there's no sign of revolt. Every things were good. Uh, people's lives were improved. There was creation of employment and, and things like this. On the other hand, you get a kind of crude, vulgar Marxist model is that um, this was a special era of oppression and the Jesus movement was the reaction against it. I think we tried to be a lot more nuanced than that in that um, for some people, this would have led to some improvements, material improvements in life. For others, it would not. Some would have been opportunist and, and so on and so forth. But what we do get, and this this is a there's a really interesting passage in Josephus, and this is where Josephus, the Jewish historian, a Jewish Roman historian, writing for Rome, is is helpful because he explains the building of Tiberius, for instance, and that people, uh, aristocrats, would have um, been given, or certain people given gifts of land, other people forcibly removed from the land, 
And this is a significant upheaval as Jesus is growing up. People will be losing their traditional uh, lo- their traditional um, household patterns. This is this is quite a dramatic change for the lives of people. And this is clearly sometimes for the worst. And in Judea to the south where Jerusalem was, um, there's a massive rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple again. Uh, takes resources and, and labour and so on from the countryside. And there are other uh, urbanisation projects as well. And again, these things have different effects on different people. But this provides a, a context for different competing material and ideological interests in uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean and helps us explain, and so I think we'll come on to, uh, why the Jesus movement emerged when and where it did and some of the claims and concerns it made and why it had a degree of popularity when and where it did. Robert? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just add a couple of things to that um, just to flesh it out. I think um, one thing that, that lays behind uh, this uh, urban development that's going on in Galilee is um, the, the Roman imperial situation that kind of casts a long shadow over the, the whole region. So... Um, in in the lifetime of Jesus, you know, uh, the Roman Empire is the the largest and most expansive political and imperial entity that has had ev- ever existed up until that time, uh, and all of Palestine was under either uh, indirect or direct control of uh, Roman power, um, depending on which part you were you were looking at, um, and. These urbanization uh, projects in Sepphoris and um, Tiberias uh, in particular, but also elsewhere in, in uh, Judea that have been going on under the, the Herods, who were uh, aristocratic, uh, uh, from an aristocratic family of, of the area, but who had been you know, installed as kind of puppet kings or, or uh, lackeys of uh, the Roman power that, that backed their own. Um, these urbanization projects were very much trying to integrate the region into this broader imperial economy, um, uh, effectively to be able to, you know, extract more more wealth from the uh, surrounding countryside. Um, uh, in the case of Tiberias, which was was built on the foreshore of the Sea of Galilee, it enabled uh, better connected elites to kind of dominate the the lake economy, the fishing that was going on in the lake economy, which would have had an impact on, you know, smaller. Uh, family-based fishing cooperatives such as uh, some of the the male disciples who are named within uh, the gospel material. Um, uh, So it would have created all sorts of interesting um, uh, changes and uh, upheavals for some as well, um, both economically and socially. Um, And, you know, just to kind of reinforce that idea of the the Roman power that was was, uh, sitting behind all of this, Tiberius um, itself was named after the Roman emperor at the time, Emperor Tiberius, uh, you know, just to, to reinforce that point. Um, some of the archaeological uh, remains from the, the rebuilt Sepphoris show that it was quite highly, you know, Romanized in its architecture. Um, and these urban environments would have uh, would have had populations that were full of wealthy cosmopolitan Jews, um, uh, from the from the Jewish population, uh, but perhaps also from elsewhere, but uh, who were seduced by the delights of of Roman culture. Um, so, you know, as 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 well as there being a kind of um, a, a class conflict um, erupting here, this could also be coded in, in in different kind of cultural understandings as well between, say, a clash between uh, 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 Roman ideas and, and Jewish ideas. Um, or, or in other ways as well that I, I hope we get to explore. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's the the background sort of economic and political context in which you know Jesus was born. So with that in mind, can you kind of talk about Jesus's childhood and the the broader context into which he was born and, and raised, and sort of how that shaped him as a, as an individual? Yeah, um, the, we can see a little bit. The this is this is where the gospels are. are very limited in what they can tell us. I mean, the, the stories of Jesus' birth and infancy, we, we might be able to pick up little details here and there and hints here and there of where he, uh, where he's from and so on. But they're kind of obviously fairly fantastical stories as well. 
So we have to we have to be more creative in thinking about well what kind of education would he have had and and things like this. So um, he would have probably got standard Jewish stories about the, the heritage, the history, the law, the traditions, and so on from synagogues, which would have may have simply been just a gathering in the in the village, not necessarily a strict building. It may have been, but the strict building that was a synagogue, but a gathering of some sorts where this would have happened. Um, it's not entirely clear that he would have learned to read. We, uh, there is a fairly convincing argument, I think, that he could have been uh, illiterate. And it's it's striking that uh, when you go from Mark's Gospel and see what Matthew and Luke do to Mark's Gospel in Mark 6, there is an attempt to make Jesus a more scribal figure, um, someone uh, 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 shifting the emphasis away from his background as um, an artisan or laborer or something like this. We know that he, I think we probably on fairly safe ground by saying that he was brought up as uh, as a laboring figure. Uh, we we know the, the usual phrase is carpenter. It's probably broader than that as a agricultural worker. Well, no, so, sorry, I mean more something like uh, a, a laboring figure could work with stone or, or wood or just generally and artisan might be a useful um, label to cover that. And uh, so we 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 can we can paint those kind of general pictures. He probably would have been expected to run the household um, um, as 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 he grew older, as the um, as the oldest male and things like this. And this is why it's quite interesting in the gospel tradition that the breakdown of household and the creation of an alternative household is a is a theme we find independently in different source material that it probably reflects some of the breakdown of this in Galilee as he's growing up. So we could do uh, things like that we can talk about Jesus' upbringing but um, as for the specifics in terms of like a sort of hard biographical account not so much, yeah. not really. Yeah, anything to add to that Robert? Yeah, I can just add um so in the Gospels themselves, in the four Gospels, uh, only two of the Gospels, Matthew and, and Luke, contain infancy narratives, um, what we call infancy narratives, you know, of the, of the kind of the, the births and, and, and the stories that uh, most people will be familiar with from the, the nativity story or the Christmas story. Um, but that nativity story is itself a, comp- a compilation of those two stories in Matthew and Luke, which um, are, when you look at them side by side, completely different. Um, they also uh, are kind of added later to the material, right? Like there's no uh, there's no infancy narrative in um, Mark. Mark, Gospel of Mark, begins with Jesus's adult uh, organizing. So what that means is, I think, as James has rightly said, we, you know, we, we can only sort of speak in, in vague or broad terms we can say well he was probably you know associated with a small village of nazareth he probably um worked uh, as a as a uh, tecton a carpenter or builder or construction uh, laborer or something like that um but i think also we can fill in some of these gaps by using a bit of historical imagination by placing jesus and his compatriots within some of the upheavals that were happening as a consequence of those those urbanization projects that we were just talking about. So, um, in the building of of uh, Tiberius and and the rebuilding of Sepphoris, um, the effects that this would have had on the countryside and you know for inhabitants of small villages like like Nazareth, where the character of of social and labor organization was being changed, there would have been um, increased. Uh, demand on their labor uh, for certain uh, or, 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 and um, competition as well uh, 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 which led, would have led to all sorts of uh, changes um, including you know the creation of, of landless peasants so uh, peasants uh, needing to be uh, moved on to make way for for these building projects um, or for other uh, reasons to support the the infrastructure of these urban uh, these urban centers um you have the the influx of kind of precarious day laborers uh with insecure work uh increasing levels of indebtedness to landlords 
um, familial breakdowns due to underlying pressures. Um, uh, banditry was something that would rise up often in response to these. Um, and I think also, you know, just the the the, the prospect of, of destitution and, and kind of itinerancy as a consequence of being displaced um, from traditional life patterns uh, was a, a very real prospect that, you know, if, if these things weren't being experienced by Jesus and his closest associates, he would have been aware of these things happening to other people within and other families within his uh, vicinity within the countryside of Galilee. Hmm. So this is a broader context of urbanization, of displacement. This has impacts on culture, on society, on the family structure and family formation. So this is a time of, you know, upheaval, of change, and it is disorienting to many people um, for obvious reasons, you know, not unlike many other periods in in human history of dramatic uh, shifts and change and the sort of political, social, and economic tumult that that can create. So this is the broader context in which Jesus is born and raised. And of course, we have some, you know, gospel, uh, you know, discussions of the early life of Jesus, as limited as they are. We have the sort of fairy tale version in our heads of the nativity scene and the three wise men you know most everybody in the western world will be familiar with that but a lot of the the details are obviously going to be missing and so we're going to have to sort of you know deduce from general trends in the society at the time of what his life his early life was probably like so that's all really really important and interesting stuff i find it endlessly fascinating and just trying to triangulate in on you know the details of of this one person's life who Historically, source-wise, we have very little to go with, but we do know the general dynamics of what's happening at that time. So with all of that in mind, you, you focus next on a really interesting figure, and this is one that I would love to learn more about, and I really loved your work on in the book, because in chapter three, you focus on John the Baptist as a sort of famous millenarian figure and a sort of ideological mentor, if you will. So who was John the Baptist, and what role did he play in the life of Jesus? Well. Um, John the Baptist seems to have been a particularly popular prophetic style, millenarian style figure of the time. A number of these seem to have popped up in the first century. And we may come to the question of millenarianism in, in due course. But he is one who arguably was at the very least as important in the popular imagination as Jesus, if not more important for many at the time. And he without trying to get into too much of the details, he clearly predicts something dramatic, some dramatic supernatural intervention in the imminent future. It, it's There is an overlap with Jesus and the Jesus movement, maybe to the point uh, uh, that they were even active side by side, but not necessarily in conflict with one another. It does seem to, the John the Baptist movement does seem to have had a significant influence on Jesus and the Jesus movement. Uh, in the in in the sort of general apocalyptic and millenarian terms, certainly, and the call for um, people to change the ways and, and things like this. Jam, likewise, is a product of his time. It's interesting that it's it, that he's remembered as the whole countryside. This is an exaggeration; doesn't doesn't matter. Uh, of Judea going out to see him. We also have an independent stuff on John the Baptist. Uh, from Josephus, which is um, particularly important because it's it's not got the f- the more elaborate uh, explanation for his death as you get in the Gospels, which is a sort of fairly gossipy story about his uh, head getting cut off you know, and the blame put on um, on certain women. In Josephus, it's a fairly brutal, typical account of how you deal with these kinds of figures in the, uh, how Rome would have dealt with these kind of figures how local rooms would have dealt with these kind of figures and that is you've got a figure out there in the wilderness in the, uh, with a significant following and what do you do with them well you kill them and you can ask questions later or you may not even bother to ask but this uh, the, the John, the ba- John the Baptist was killed by uh, uh, Herod Antipas who was the local ruler and this seems to have been a particularly controversial decision. It wasn't simply just another, another prophet that was killed. He seems to have been a particularly uh, popular prophet that a lot of the Jewish populace were very unhappy that he was killed. And when Herod Antipas lost uh, a battle, 
he uh, they they said this was punishment for how he treated uh, John the Baptist. So uh, he was he was a popular figure, and the fact that he was killed for being a popular figure wasn't unusual, and it's an important context for understanding Jesus. That um, I think we. Uh, uh, where I would agree, or where we might agree with certain conservative scholars here, is that that Jesus almost certainly did predict, would have predicted the very likely possibility he would be killed. I don't think it's just simply the gospel writers um, looking back and fitting this into the life of Jesus to to explain why he died. I think it's very likely that Jesus knew that um, his actions would lead to his death. Because it's exactly what happens to any kind of figure who has a following in certain contexts. And if he was uh, active at Passover, he must have had some awareness that he, he could die like John the Baptist. So with John the Baptist looming there in the background, you've got the idea of um, not only the influence of things like apocalypticism and millenarianism, but you've also got the uh, looming over your shoulder that death. You know, the, you could... Uh, you. Uh, Jesus and his closest followers were putting their lives on the line by having a following in this kind of context, and they would have known it. Mm. Yeah, and Robert, uh, you can add anything you want, but also maybe if you can also throw in some of the, insofar as you know what they are, the ideas that John the Baptist were promoting that that were so dangerous to yeah. the ruling class. Yeah, yeah. I, I think just, yeah, following on exactly what James was saying, the um, the, the usefulness of looking at, at John the Baptist's movement is because he was one, you know, in terms of constructing this life of, of Jesus and the early Jesus movement, was that John was another one, or the movement associated with John the Baptist was another one of these popular first century Jewish social movements that, like the early Jesus movement, was um, emerging as a kind of symptom of uh, wider socioeconomic uh, upheaval, or at least the, the perception of, of deeply felt crises. And um, within within that that uh, kind of context, um, these social movements, these Jewish social movements, often took on uh, what James has referred to as this millenarian or apocalyptic uh, uh, thinking, which was particularly widespread uh, within that context at the time. And it was a way of, um, uh, I suppose, both. Um, you know, threatening and dreaming about a, a, a time that, you know, could happen imminently or soon when uh, divine forces, when supernatural forces, God would come in and intervene and, and um, uh, the, the current power brokers of society, the current elite who were in power would be cast aside and a new age or a new kingdom would be inaugurated. And so um, uh, John the Baptist uh, and his movement is is quite clearly, uh, it seems, um, promoting this idea of of a coming uh, uh, judgment when uh, these things will happen. And it seems that the early Jesus movement adopts this kind of thinking as well. Um, but you know, this also is an opportunity to talk about uh, some of the other interesting popular social movements in the first century, um, which again are kind of similar. Um, both similar and different to what the early Jesus movement were doing, what John the Baptist movement were doing. So there's also, um, we find out from uh, Josephus, and also actually um, the, the book of Acts in the New Testament has references to uh, a popular first century prophet known as the Egyptian, who combined this idea of, of supernatural intervention uh, and an age to come with violence, violence subversion, uh, such as overthrowing the the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, um, and um, uh, you know uh, Josephus interestingly kind of dismisses this figure as as a charlatan and a false prophet. Uh, he gathers this massive popular following of something like thirty thousand, and according to Josephus, they they fall for his propaganda. I should point out that Josephus was you know writing from an aristocratic class position, right? So he's often quite dismissive of these popular movements, but it, it, he's still useful as a historical source in this way because he's t because he still mentions them, right? Even if he's he's, he's scathing of them. And it, it, another one, uh, another movement that, that cropped up around this time was uh, this popular movement associated with the figure of Theudas, who um, 
uh, led a, a movement to the River Jordan where he announced that he would separate the, the river, thereby allowing people to pass through it. And, um, you know, again, this is this is one of these millenarian type uh, social movements because it envisages uh, radical transformation of the current age into a new age through uh, dramatic actions and divine intervention. And in this case, uh, Theudas was tapping into well-known uh, Jewish traditions about Moses parting the Red Sea to deliver his his people from uh, to freedom. So, um, and, and you know, as uh, James mentioned, um, these popular movements or the leaders identified uh, with these popular movements would often die. They would be, you know they would be killed because of their uh, the the perceived threat that. Um, those in power would, would view them with, so Theudas eventually loses his head. Um, and it's interesting that actually the, the Book of Acts, um, although, you know, it, it, it with this early Jesus movement is, is trying to uh, show how the Jesus movement is different in some way, it actually suggests still that, that there were some uh, authorities in Jerusalem who saw the, the new Jesus movement as comparable to the Theudas movement. So from, you know, the perspective of the elites in power, they couldn't often s- distinguish between these different millenarian groups propping up here, there, and everywhere, responding to uh, the social and material uh, conditions of their time and place. Um, famously, uh, as, as James mentioned with John the Baptist, he has a, a, a conflict with uh, Herod, at least according to um, uh, the Gospels, um, he, you know, as James rightly put it, it's a kind of gossipy account. But the the criticism was to do with the the, the loose sexual morals or the loose uh, morals of those elite uh, in power of Herod, um, you know, in their castles, uh, blandering around or whatever, and and that's what really got him in trouble. Um, so uh, you know, power can can crack down on these movements. Um, I think almost as a matter of process and then, you know, possibly ask questions about it later. Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of thinking, you know, in, in the American context, um, the sort of like you were talking, uh, James and, and Robert were both mentioning this idea that, you know, these other figures like John the Baptist and previous figures were killed. It was a matter of routine to kill figures like this. Jesus certainly knew that insofar as he was another one of these Jewish millenarian movements that he was almost certainly slated for some sort of death and execution at some point. Here in the U.S. in the Black Liberation Movement in the Civil Rights era, figures like Malcolm X, like Fred Hampton, like Martin Luther King Jr., I think they too also knew in one way or another, in Malcolm X and, and Fred Hampton's case, they explicitly said in so many terms, like, it's almost certain that they're going to kill me. Or, you know, Fred Hampton would talk about if I die, it's not going to be because I slip on ice or I get in a plane crash. It's going to be because, it's going to be because the power structure comes and kills me. And sure enough, they all were killed uh, one way or another. Um, and, and there was a sense in which they all knew it to, to varying degrees. And it's, it puts you in a very interesting mind, <laughs> mindset if you know that, you know, your revolutionary agitation has gotten to such a point that, you know, death is almost certainly coming from the powers that be, and then what that does to how you proceed from there. Uh, it's a fascinating sort of psychological thing. But yeah, but f- for those that just just to reiterate what both of you said, uh, millenarianism is a sort of uh, apocalypticism. This, the, the, end, uh, some, the end is coming, maybe not the end of everything, but the end of the current order of things. It would, it would, it would be sort of synonymous with divine judgment it will overthrow the current state of affairs and usher in a new era, a new world, if you will. And that, of course, is going to be incredibly annoying at the very least to the powers that be um, to go around and, and, and sort of rabble rouse on this idea that the fundamental features of the so- current social order are unjust. God's judgment is on the way and a new dawn is, is coming. You know, of course, they're going to want to sort of shut these figures up. So that is a, a, a broad, even more context into, uh, you know, even more insight into what 
eventually coalesces as the Jesus movement. And you've, you've talked about the Jesus movement as opposed to simply Jesus because, of course, as historical materialists, we're talking about these broader social, economic, political conditions out of which these movements and these individual leaders or figures emerge. So can you talk a little bit more about the, the Jesus movement, which you refer to, interestingly, as a sort of vanguard party of sorts in your book? Uh, maybe discuss its revolutionary as well as its reactionary aspects, which I found quite interesting and what its general aims and and sort of tactics were it's again one of the reasons why we think of movement because it's it was has to have some kind of cultural credibility among the peasantry for it to work Uh, so uh, and this is where we have i think on certain what what we might label conservative elements i mean a lot of um more supposedly radical scholarship on the historical jesus over the past over the 20th century and, and before, I've tried to really emphasize, particularly, well, actually, particularly since the 60s, I've really tried to emphasize how morally uh, playful Jesus was and, and things like this, but uh, um, on issues of sexuality, gender, and, and so on. And some of this it can be is good scholarship, but some of it goes too far, I think, in claiming that Jesus was, you know, something like a post 1960s uh, radical that we would all be familiar with. Whereas I don't think that would, we just simply wouldn't have made any sense in first century Galilee. And this is why there's a big emphasis, as we know from uh, from movements at the time or from uh, the populace at the time, on in, inherited tradition, the, the Jewish law, uh, and the commandments and things like this. And, and as Robert mentioned before, the some of the criticisms of the Herodian court is about uh, perception of loose morals and, and, and things like this, so there there is that that element of conservatism, if that is even the right phrase, to the Jesus movement, and one that is probably so necessary for it to be culturally credible. But it's also a movement that's promoting dramatic and significant social upheaval at the time. So uh, there is this promise of. Um, uh, the present existing order that will be cast aside and the, a new order put in its place. And again, it's it's hierarchical because that's it's it's coming from the peasantry, it's working with peasant categories, and it's a form of utopianism that's still hierarchical rather than this sort of playful egalitarianism that some post nineteen sixties scholars w- would like to have. Um, so those are the sort of broad ideas that are coming out of this this tension between whatever conservatism and uh radical change and and the vision the millenarian vision is fantastical in one sense it's not one that does resolve the problems on the ground there is a a kind of conservatism also in its revolutionary attitude that uh, in the sense that it's hacking it's it's the idea of a of a something like repeating a golden age or pushing towards an ideal context where where there would be an ideal king where there would be judges where God would rule, where there would be uh, an accompanying empire and things like this. And this is why, I mean, we some people I don't think will like it. We use the language of vanguard and so on. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of a bit tongue-in-cheek, but there is a serious point behind it in that it is, in one sense, it's reaching for trying to... Uh, there, there is a clear, strong awareness that there's something profoundly wrong with the world, yet at the same time... Uh, its solution is one that's fantastical. It can only be resolved in this fantastical vision of the future and can't quite grasp to something else. And and in one sense, why would it be able to? I mean, it's coming from a context where we haven't got the full development of socialist ideas or or the equivalent. Um, And it's it's a form of utopianism, I think, grounded in a peasant context, which is still fairly parochial, still uh, traditional and, and all this. And that's not um, um, a, a criticism as such. It's, a, it's a, This is why I think a historical materialist perspective is important because it takes seriously the material conditions in which this stuff arises rather than romanticizing it or making it anachronistic. And that's why I think we use the words like vanguard and dictatorship of the peasantry because it is the idea that it will be a rulership on behalf of the peasantry. But it's also one that's fantastical as well. It doesn't quite get to the stage where the contradictions will be resolved or where injustice will be uh, wiped out. It, it replicates a system of power that it already knows and hasn't got 
really yet. We've got they haven't got the potential for the new to grow out of the alls. I don't think. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think um, just just adding to that that um, the with a few specifics the the kind of intoxicated on this this millenarian uh, worldview where you know God is going to uh, intervene shortly um, at the end times and and install this new age bring about this new age and and kind of right the wrongs of uh of uh palestine as as they're being experienced by uh, the non-elite in that society uh the jesus movement the early jesus movement develops this um i think quite clear manifesto at least in its early stages which is that and this is what we we, we argue in the book that the rich um and the wealthy uh, those largely responsible for the material changes affecting Galilee and Judea, those behind the building projects or benefiting from um, these urbanization projects, will need to surrender their wealth, uh, preferably to the the Jesus movement, or they will face severe divine wrath at the coming judgment. Um, So, um, and uh, alongside this is this promise that the, the socioeconomic hierarchies within uh, Palestine are going to be reversed uh, at this um, end time. Uh, the first will become last and the last will become first, quite literally. So as James was saying, it doesn't kind of do away with hierarchies. And this is perhaps one of the the, the areas where uh, it's not quite as um, uh, revolutionary as we might like. It's revolutionary, but to a point. So this new world that it imagines is still a world with um, with uh, uh, a, a, a kingdom and lords and people in power who rule autocratically, except that this time you're going to have uh, a, a, a new king or an ideal king such as Jesus in, in charge who's going to rule on behalf of the God of Israel um, in favor of a different empire, an empire not uh, backed by Rome, but backed by uh backed by God, the kingdom of God, or or, or the kingdom of the heavens. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's really important just to say, like, and this is totally in line with historical materialism, like, this is what we should expect. This is of the time. This is of the concerns of those people at that time. And there's this very deep temptation um, that we all suffer across the political spectrum today um, that we have of imposing our current political ideals on Jesus and his movement to sort of lend credibility to our ideas. So there's like this liberal hippie pacifist and sandals version of Jesus. There's this, as you taught, this Che Guevara socialist revolutionary version. I see it all over in America. This, I think millions of Americans believe that Jesus was this family values oriented conservative that, you know, didn't like gay marriage and stuff. And you can even see like the more intense versions of like blood and sword fever dream fascists trying to claim Christianity and the life of Jesus um, for themselves and their political movement. But we, we often forget how much our, our politics today are shaped by things like the Enlightenment, like the French Revolution. Um, these, can, these are you know, 2,000 years before these things even happen is what we're dealing with in first century Palestine. And so we should always be very skeptical, even as tempting as it may be, skeptical of any impulse to try to impose any sort of modern political ideal on Jesus and his movement. But one thing you do talk about that I found very interesting, especially in light of certain political topics today, is that the Jesus movement, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there were certain accusations of them being effeminate. And there's these issues of masculinity and this reclamation of masculinity. This, of course, is a very patriarchal time, as of course we should expect it to be. But can either of you talk a little bit more about these sort of accusations of of effeminacy and the issues of masculinity and how they were sort of wrestled with and resolved within the Jesus movement itself? Yeah, I mean, this is this is part of why we we emphasize the issue, the context of the breakdown of households and things like this, because if you're no longer the man running the household, what are you doing? Uh, You're no longer fulfilling your your allotted role and the um 
Uh, and, and and I think that some scholars have made a, a convincing argument that the Jesus movement were the recipients of allegations that they were effeminate, and for these precise reasons, so, socially castrated, as one scholar put it. Now, I I, I wouldn't leave it there. I mean, the, the, there is an alternative family that you get with the Jesus movement. You know, these are my brothers and sisters, uh, and and so there's clearly. They use the language of family to talk about um, uh, what this movement is. Because, again, it's the language of the time. It's the language that it's known. And where I think we differ from some of the uh, so-called queer readings of the gospel tradition is that, is yes, we think there is this kind of family that probably did get mocked. But also, it was uh, the movement seems to have taken these ideas very seriously. And uh, again, some scholars we don't think that this was a uh, this was out you know somehow got rid of the father figure. In fact, it got it included the sort of super father figure. God, or the mm-hmm. father, is, a, is is the dominant father figure in this new family movement. So it's play it's it's a sort of competing uh, about uh, masculinity and femininity. And we and, and we argue uh, uh, that the Jesus movement also played this game, you know, accusing its opponents of being the, you know, we're the masculine ones, you're the, the uh, feminine ones. And this is part of a wider discourses in, in the ancient world, which is about domination, conquering, and, and so on and so forth, you know, the, about the claims to be who's the masculine one, who's the uh, feminine one, and things like this. So, um, uh, I mean, Robert might want to talk about the, the clothing issue here, but we, we, we've even got passages which do have um jesus talking about the uh, the way john the baptist was clothed compared to the um what we think is the effeminate clothing or what we still think is the effeminate clothing but what we think that jesus and the jesus movement would have thought of as the effeminate clothing of the uh ruling elite so the it's this sort of claim and counterclaim about who are the masculine ones who are the uh, who are the uh effeminate ones that i think runs right through the story of uh, the Jesus movement from its beginnings right through to uh, the crucifixion at the end, which again is again competing ideas. Was was suffering beatings and crucifixion? Was this uh, Jesus being made effeminate by his captors? I'm sure that people did think of it like that. Was it also seen as Jesus being able to take uh, a beating like a man, so to speak? I'm sure that that was a, a live idea of masculinity at the time as well so it's not a question of um jesus taking on these claims and playing around with them it's it's jesus taking on jesus moving taking on these claims and making counter claims about who's got the rightful claim to be in the masculine movement here mm. yeah robert anything to add to that i mean just to to reaffirm that in, in the roman world in particular um gender was was a huge concern and it was and it was as james mentioned understood in ways that could be coded like politically and across class lines and um and in ways that uh you know if we bring our attention uh, to it we i think can can understand because gender is once again a a, a, a you know quite a, a major concern in our time um but uh in terms of how it was was understood in that world it was heavily patriarchal uh but there wasn't as such a kind of you know feminist critique against uh patriarchal power um so these ideas could be negotiated and to uh negotiate um with uh, the powers of the day you know um you you would also be stepping into the terrain of of gender discourses just to give one example that we flesh out a bit in the book uh the the, the roman empire itself when it would um when it's uh, elite authors would talk about um, its military exploits around um, around the empire or expanding the borders of the empire it would talk about you know defeating and emasculating its um, uh, 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 subservient nations so this whole kind of you know active rome versus passive defeated conquered humiliated uh, nations was understood often in this gendered way, and there are visual depictions of this as well. We include a, a, a relief that shows the uh, in the book that shows the emperor Claudius uh, like pinning down a, a, a female figure, 
who is meant to embody the nation of Britannia being conquered by uh, Roman power. So it was it, it, these sorts of ideas were understood in, you know, uh, kind of gendered violent type ways. Uh, also, crucifixion itself was a, a form of, of kind of gendered uh, violence, punishment, where um, the the uh, victim often from a, or usually from a, a, a subservient uh, conquered uh, peoples of the Roman Empire, uh, and it was a Roman punishment, I should point out, um, at that time, um, administered by the Romans, intent to, you know, display their bodies uh, and um, uh, kind of ritually humiliate them. Um, they're fully exposed and they're, you know, uh, uh, penetrated by nails and, and, and so on and so forth. It's really meant to humiliate and shame, and this was understood in a, a kind of gendered way. Um, so for the Jesus movement to engage in this world as a popular movement, uh, it would, at, at, as James has already indicated, at, on the one hand, um, was getting la labelled, it seems, as you know, uh, being kind of socially castrated or effeminate uh, eunuchs for the for the sake of the kingdom, perhaps. But it it um, it ironically kind of embraced. Uh, some of these ideas and tried to turn them on on its head, while at the same time asserting its own uh, masculine credentials, often through this redefinition of terms. So uh, you have uh, these ideas about um, uh, dying uh, in wider uh, Jewish texts of the time, uh, dying a, a glorious death um, as this display of masculine bravado and so on and so forth, this could be, you know, an assured way to divine victory and all of this. So this stuff is quite complicated and um, it doesn't always go in, in, in one direction. But um, I suppose the, the point that James was trying to make and uh, or was making and, and um, we, we definitely flesh this out in the book is that just because the Jesus movement is playing with these ideas and negotiating these ideas to do with gender doesn't necessarily mean that it's overturning the, the dominant discourse. It it's really more a negotiation of of broader power structures and um it it doesn't do away with uh the dominant prevailing patriarchal gender uh conventions it simply tries to um redefine them for its own purposes so the idea of of uh masculine male power uh, uh being associated with um uh, the right to rule and all of that um still seems to be something that the the early Jesus movement subscribed to. So again, this is one of the perhaps more uh, conservative, what we would cons call conservative aspects of what was otherwise a, a, a revolutionary movement uh, promoting uh, radical social and economic changes. So we don't, we uh, think that, you know, there's this traditional idea that, uh, or view that Jesus was uh, primarily had this mission to the poor, that um, his message was primarily directed to uh, the poorest of society. Um, um, but we actually uh, turn this on its head and suggest that Jesus actually, or the early Jesus movement, had a mission to the rich. Uh, the Gospels state unambiguously that Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance and uh, in the book we develop a, an argument as to why the common understanding of of sinners as uh, kind of downtrodden societal outcasts uh, is actually wrong um looking at a, a range of of jewish texts uh, from across um over a thousand years actually of jewish texts there's uh, a, quite a consistent uh, meaning of what this this term means, sinners, it actually meant in ancient Judaism uh, at its kind of basic level, lawbreakers, those who uh, break the the Mosaic law or the, the the Torah, and who act as if there was no God. Um, and in any of these texts, whenever the socioeconomic status of uh, sinners is mentioned, um, it's always in reference to them being oppressive or exploitative rich people. So we think that when uh, the gospel texts um, are talking about uh, Jesus, for example, dining with tax collectors and sinners, uh, 
he's referring here to rich sinners, those uh, who are perceived to be uh, possibly responsible for or benefiting from these urbanization projects um, in Galilee and Judea. Um, and it was, you know, to these people that that uh, Jesus was able to associate through his his recruiting, say, Levi, the tax collector, who would have had networks to some of these rich sinners. And it's it's seen or presented within the gospel material as scandalous precisely because these were wealthy, uh, wealthier, corrupt individuals regarded popularly as, as lawbreakers oppressing their own people. And so this message to the rich, the mission to the rich, was uh, to try and convince them to to change their ways, to uh, give up their wealth, preferably to the movement, to, to keep it going, um, and to call them to repentance uh, before uh, God would would uh, come in and it would be too late and God would smash um, <laughs> and upturn society uh, and, uh, you know, they would be... Um, um, uh, suffering a, a, a not so great fate. Yeah, so there you see Jesus, the Jesus movement sort of widening its circle of concern and compassion to include even the people that are on the wrong side of the fight, trying to convince them um, to kind of you know turn over their wealth and, and join the side of of the good. But even just giving them that option was sort of seen as scandalous. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it is exactly correct. Um, and uh, and just just to add, really that. This is this this forms part of the networks that help the movement spread beyond just the uh, the local. In a way, the, the the looks like the early movement has these networks with not just the peasantry, but with what people with greater wealth, with um, with even perhaps if you believe uh, Luke's gospel to the royal court or to the aristocratic court itself. If we take Mark's gospel, there are uh, women with resources providing for them. So the, it, this may have been a failed mission in one level to the rich, but it was also um, one that helped the movement spread beyond its parochial origins uh, and a movement after Jesus' death. Yeah, I just find that that endlessly fascinating at just how these debates were you know, taking place at the time, the fact that they're still so salient they're still so at the forefront of our political struggles to this day although the details and and the forms that these arguments take are are very different of course um on our our, our sister podcast red menace we're working through um frederick engels is on the origin of the family private property in the state Uh and that's a historical materialist account of the family and its formations and of importantly patriarchy and of course engels makes this argument that with the rise of class society which certainly you know, Jesus' world was a class society world. That's the introduction of patriarchy, pre-class society. There were there were many examples of sort of matriarchal societies, and patriarchy really only, at least this is the argument that Engels is making, we can argue about it, debate it, etc., but that patriarchy emerges um, with uh, the emergence of, of class um, stratification in society. And so it's very interesting to think about patriarchy at this time in the context of Engels' work on the development and the, in the sort of historical materialist analysis of patriarchy rising. Um, but yeah, I just found that, that part of the book in particular to be really interesting. And of course, this is just an interview. Um, if, you, if you are at all interested with this stuff, like you can dive much, much deeper with the book, which I'll link to in the show notes so people can find it, and I highly recommend it. A couple more questions for you. I do want to be very respectful of James's time. I know that we're all on different time zones here uh, from every edge of the Anglos- Anglosphere, apparently. Uh, we're having this conversation. So uh, a couple more questions for you. And uh, this is a big question. You can take it in any any direction you want. But in chapter 9, titled Passover in Jerusalem, you talk about the entering of Jerusalem, the temple, the Last Supper, the defection of a comrade, referring to Judas, etc. Can you kind of talk about and maybe summarize uh, uh, this part of the story? Yeah, it's... I mean, this is... The last week of Jesus is one that... is another one of these ones that's very difficult to uh, disentangle from the rewriting the uh, the the, the 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 importance of Jesus death for the emerging christian movement and things like this but we can we can do some things with it and uh, and uh, and we can probably make some generalizations about early material so 
for instance, if we can think, we can imagine what Passover was like uh, at the time in uh, in Jerusalem. It would have been heaving. It would have been absolutely packed, and it's a celebration of the Exodus and escape from Pharaoh and the effective, you know, uh, freeing of the slaves and things like this. So that's the narrative that's there at Passover. So it's it's a it's a narrative that's in a context with a lot of people present, huge crowds. So the potential is there for this to spark off, and all sides knew the potential was there for this to spark off. Romans, Jewish leaders, uh, Jewish populace, and things like this. So those tensions are, are always potentially there. And this sort of thread runs throughout that story, and I think it's, a, it's particularly important. And we see Jesus make it, doing some sort of disturbance in the temple, and it's, kind of, it's interesting what happens is that he doesn't get arrested immediately because of a supportive crowd. There is a group around him who... Uh, are clearly interested and signed up to what the Jesus movement uh, are about. Because if you do get rid of a figure who might be another John the Baptist, you may have a, a serious riot on your hands. The, From what we can tell, the action that Jesus does in the temple where he turns over the tables of the money changers and dove sellers is one, I think, that's economic in its target, Um whether it's targeting the price of doves, which would have been the animals for the poorer people to sacrifice with and, the, the, um, and potentially escalating costs, or money changes, which is obviously focusing on uh, the money itself. Um, as a side issue, the money may well have had, uh, looks like it would have had an image of a Syrian god on it, which can quite easily be perceived by the Jesus movement as idolatrous and things like this. But it's also, of course, the money in one level will be uh, going through the tributary system, through the temple uh, and beyond to um, uh, to pay the higher ups in that sense. You can put it like that. So there's a there's a, a there's a lot at stake in a way, um, and there there isn't um, the immediate attempt to uh, kill Jesus. It looks like it's been done fairly covertly uh, uh, when the opportunity is right. The, who knows whether this was the the real explanation, but it's about as good as we've got, so it's certainly possible. And when when we compare it with John's gospel, it's not this action in the temple that leads to his death; it's the raising from the dead of this figure called Lazarus. So this is another example where we can see John's gospel. The, the, I mean, I don't think there's any way that that could be historically accurate. Whereas I could see something like this temple action being a perfectly reasonable explanation for why Jesus ends up. On a cross, it's another case of this uh, this millenarian figure, this figure with a following, cause doing something that causes just a bit too much worry for uh, the ruling class. So, the the story as well of Passover, the final Passover. I mean, there is a bit of a tendency now, I think, in liberal scholarship to try to disassociate Jesus from having a Passover meal, and I think it's sort of well intentioned. It's it's often designed to say that uh, to uh, he's always got a, a contemporary implication that Christians are trying to sort of steal Jewish ideas about cedar and Passover and things like this. And that's that's another question as far as I'm concerned, because I think whatever modern Christians do about Passover and so on, I think it's uh, I think what we get in Mark's gospel, the, uh, the earliest account of this is a Passover meal. Uh, and lots of the assumptions about Passover are there in the meal. It's uh, it's not, incidentally, the traditional 13 or whatever uh, uh, of the, the famous picture. It's If you read Mark's Gospel carefully, it does look like there's a sizable crowd in a room uh, with the 12 disciples and a wider group of disciples, and it follows what roughly what we know about Passover meals at the time, and Jesus interprets his death in a mar- in, in terms of how uh, of martyrdom in terms of traditions about the value of a martyr's death for the salvation of Israel and things like this the stuff we get in Mark's gospel i think is again it's not that heavily christianized at times when it comes to the martyrdom it looks uh, uh, to me as if this is focusing on jewish salvation jewish redemption and things like this rather than a wider group of non-jews and things like this and it's looking to a time when the kingdom will come and there will be a new empire or a new theocracy established in the not-too-distant future. And I think this generally 
is to why Jesus gets put to death. That he's got the following. He's predicting that the Roman Empire will come to an end. It it doesn't really matter that um, he's going to expect God to do it. From the perspective of Roman power, there's your threat. There's your reason. You don't have to think. Well, you know. Well, was he a, was he a real revolution? He was going to overthrow Roman power with swords and all this. Well, they don't care about the niceties of things like that. Fine, kill him. And it's 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 interesting if you look at the story of the of Jesus being put to death. It's uh, he's he's got a uh, he's he's, he's serious armed guard he's killed with insurrectionists or bandits or whatever however you want to uh, uh, interpret the the word he's killed as an insurrectionist as a bandit as someone who could have led a, a physical revolution in the here and now even if he was thinking god or god's agents would supernaturally intervene in the not too distant future uh, to change things from the perspective of the ruling class they do not care about disentangling the niceties about um, whether this, you know, how how this person thinks Rome's going to come to an end. This person is anti-Roman, anti-imperial in whatever sense, whether he thinks it's going to be a supernatural theocracy or whether he thinks there's going to be an armed uprising or whatever. They, they don't care about those kinds of niceties and that's why he ends up in a Roman cross. Just like John the Baptist died because he had a following, there's no indication John the Baptist was going to lead uh, a violent, um, insurrection against the ruling class. He thought, probably like Jesus, that it would be a divine, supernatural intervention. But they don't ask those kind of questions. The, why would they waste their time uh, with the nice theological niceties of these movements? You put them to death. That's just the way the Rome function. Mm. Powerfully, powerfully said. All right. So all of this inevitably results in the crackdown on the Jesus movement, and as James was mentioning, obviously the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, of course, what happens after the, the crucifixion is absolutely crucial for the next 2,500 years of human history. So can you talk a little bit about um, the crucifixion, what happened after, and how the Jesus movement evolved after Jesus' death? Yeah, I think I'll, um, Robert can speak more about the burial. Um, um, but as I said, um, he ends up the, 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 he ends up being killed as a bandit, as an insurrectionist. And, uh, and in one sense, the movement should have ended there. As I said earlier, there's already networks in place for the movement to spread anyway, independently, if you like, of his death. There are, there are women who provide for him, it seems, women of some means. There are the networks involving tax collectors and fishing. So this, uh, we've, uh, uh, at some point also... This gets taken up as a scribal movement, which helps it spread. So this is already taking place sort of almost, not independently of the crucifixion, but it's, it's happening sort of organically around there. The, um, after his death, people um, believe that they saw the historical, sorry, they saw the risen Jesus. Now, I, I've expressed, you know, some general scepticism towards what we can know, but curiously, some of the best early material we have is about witnesses to the risen Jesus. So Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, is a, um, uh, he's part of a tradition of people claiming to have seen the risen Jesus. And I, and I think this, um, this is actually, this is, I think it's true in one sense. Not that I'm, not, I'm making no claims about the supernatural whatever behind it. But I'm thinking people do have visions. People did have visions or claim to have visions, and they claimed to have seen the risen Jesus. I think that's just, um, one of the base facts we can actually say. Now, I, I'm not in the game, and I couldn't care less about assessing its supernatural validity or not. But um, but it, it does help the movement continue in one sense that people believed that this figure of Jesus um, had survived death and, and and continued. So, uh, and this seems to have been. A number of the uh, early followers and people who had not followed Jesus in his lifetime experiencing or claiming to have experienced a uh, vision or experience of Jesus. So everything's sort of now in place for this movement to continue and survive. It's a combination of um, these uh, claims to have seen Jesus and the networks that are helping this movement spread, intentionally or not, interestingly. I mean, it's it, whether it more resemblance to what Jesus would have wanted is another question, and perhaps in many ways it, it didn't. But it's uh, so it's already spreading out to the to, uh, beyond its sort of parochial Galilean context. 
and then it gets um, into so for, I mean just think of Passover people come to Passover from, uh, uh, to Jerusalem from wherever and then they'll go back out to wherever they came from so already networks are developing to help spread this movement and networks are very important for the spread of any movement political religious or whatever um, uh, and the movement then can uh according to the book of acts and i think there may be some truth in this synagogues provide an important means around the roman empire for this movement to spread and that's an obvious one where anyone with jewish any jewish person with connections to the jesus movement one of your first pot of calls would have been synagogue workplace would be the other one um heads of households would be points of contacts in different cities uh, around the mediterranean so there's a sort of pre-existing Jewish networks as pre, uh, pre uh, and connected to them a uh, 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 work networks and things like this for the movement to spread, and I think this is where we can make some of the this sort of unintended consequences of some of the mission and some of this idea of the mission to the rich is important because it was to the sinners as Robert said, and it's to people who are perceived to be acting uh, beyond the law and so on, and it was a word also used for non-Jews, uh, for Gentiles. So that all already gives you sort of it gives them justification for talking to people beyond uh, uh, normal Jewish context, and we do know that there were Gentiles uh, attracted to some degree or other to Judaism. People, uh, there were Gentiles who were associated with synagogues um, and had varying degrees of affiliation and connection and sympathies and so on. And once you've got the you've got interested non-Jews attending uh, synagogues and coming into contact with this meeting and a kind of ideological justification for this movement to engage further these people will go away, they'll go back to their other work networks, they'll go back to their families and they won't necessarily be interested in uh, Jewish ideas about uh, avoidance of pork, about Sabbath and so on and so forth so very rapidly over the first decade or so you've got um, people attracted increasingly to this movement who are no longer that interested in the details of Jewish law and that's when Paul can come in and start talking about justification by faith, why these people are justified not by the uh, traditional law of Judaism but by faith and this is when the movement is, is sort of the beginnings if you like of a non-Jewish movement and by the time we start getting to John's gospel, I mean this is a, perhaps a more controversial point but we're not alone in making this is you start getting this is why ideas of Jesus being equal with God start to really take off and being take off in distinction from Judaism. It's the Jews who are becoming the uh, the opponents uh, at this point in Christianity and setting the scene for the construction of a Christian identity that's not Jew Jewish and the you know the dark history that can accompany that. And again, I'm not blaming John's Gospel or whatever for creating anti Semitism or something, but the, obviously these stories have um, uh, a, a very significant reception history. This idea of constructing Christianity as something that is potentially not Jewish and the, the idea that Jesus is the God uh, in distinction from the God of the Jews and things like this. Well, I mean, it becomes a lot more complicated, obviously, but those kinds of things start to emerge, I think, towards the end of the first century uh, uh, and, in, and into the second century. And eventually this movement can keep spreading through these big networks across the Roman Empire and becomes the religion of the empire after uh, after a few centuries. And so all that language of theocracy and empire and so on can get reappropriated for an actual Roman Empire and for a history of, of, of uh, Christian power in, later on in feudal Europe and so on and so forth. But at the same time, those tensions between the uh these kind of reactionary elements if you like well perhaps we shouldn't even be calling them reactionary elements and my revolutionary impulses they don't go away there is still all these stories about the reversal of rich and poor and so on and with christianity becoming the language and religion of empire and then the language and religion of uh of, of feudal europe in the long run it's also the language of opposition to it so we get peasant uprisings and revolts and so on in medieval Europe with explicit reference back to some of these gospel texts these uh, more seemingly radical economically radical gospel texts and likewise when we get into the era of capitalism um, religion, uh, Christianity uh, 
takes on the same kind of role of justifying the emergence of capitalism, but it also gets absorbed and taken up in certain socialist circles as well as opposition to capitalism or something that could be, or the, you know, in certain socialist circles, it'd be, let's extract the best bits from Christianity again uh, to try to envisage a new socialist world. So there's those kind of, uh, that's the sort of longer, bigger picture that, you know, there's, there's your historical materialism for you, if you like, the transformation to feudalism and then to capitalism and what lies beyond. Yeah, that, that is so interesting. So this movement that was a Jewish millenarianist movement at the time, and he, you know, at the, towards the end of his life, he sits down with these sinners, which as Robert was talking about, these, the translation is lawbreakers, breaking the Torah law, and the, the corrupt rich people on the other side of this struggle. He sits down with them, and that sitting down with these sinners, these lawbreakers, also sets a sort of precedent to, for that movement to be able to appeal on some level to Gentiles, and that yeah. allows it to grow beyond merely Jewish communities to become a much bigger thing. And then with the subsequent development of feudalism and then capitalism, you see both sides of historical development using the Jesus story, the Jesus movement, the Bible as a whole to sort of justify its claim. I mean, of course, it becomes it? what started as an anti-Roman Empire movement becomes the ideology of the empire. And then with capitalism, you have and even with abolition in, in the U.S. of slavery, you had people pro-abolition, you know, pro-abolitionists and those who wanted to maintain slavery both arguing from the Bible, both using exactly. the Jewish story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely fascinating, yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Robert? Yeah, I, th I think just on, uh, just right back to the, the those moments uh, following Jesus' death and, um, the you know, what's become the Easter celebration uh, through the Christian tradition, Christians would see this as, as of primary importance in terms of what, you know, started the movement and, 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 some uh, Christian scholars, uh, well-known Christian scholars, such as N.T. Wright, evangelical scholars, um, have, he's even said that uh, the resurrection was, and he uses um, uh, quite political language. He says it's the day that the uh, the day that the revolution began. This truly decisive event in in world history, when Jesus's associates find his coming back to a life, a new commissioning that subsequently changed world history. Um, we we kind of make a bit of fun of of this perspective, uh, not out of disrespect to it, but precisely because we think that it, it completely misses the broader historical materialist points that that uh, James is getting at there in terms of the 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 broader socio economic factors that were all entangled with these religious factors that uh, helped the movement to spread. Which I think you know uh, we need to be looking at these. Uh, from whatever religious perspective we're looking at, as long as we're looking at it from a historical materialist perspective, um, these broader forces are important. But I think also uh, it's worth stressing that uh, even expectations of resurrection uh, within first century Judaism were not unprecedented or unique to the Jesus movement. So as a kind of singular cause as to why uh, the Jesus movement might spread and survive, I don't think this would have been enough. Uh, in the first century, many Jews were uh, apocalyptic Jews, fueled by millenarian fervor, believed that the righteous uh, would be would rise at or before the end times, and it seems that the Jesus movement uh, had this ready-made millenarian framework in mind, through which they were able to interpret uh, these experiences or, or visions of a, a postmortem Jesus that they had, that James mentioned. Um, so uh, Jesus's associates could draw on these pre-existing ideas within the Jewish tradition about righteous martyrs being raised back to life. And in fact, this uh, aligned to and confirmed their expectations of uh, this imminent divine intervention and reversal they had been promoting. Um, uh, the inbreaking of God's kingdom. And so, you know, in the earliest uh, account that we have of this, which is actually still quite late, it's not, it's not until the fifties that we get the first, that we have the first surviving written account of, of, uh, or explanation of, of this evidence for resurrection, as, as James mentioned in Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians chapter 15. Um, but he talks here about 
you know, this resurrection as being proof that God's kingdom is breaking in and it's going to lead to, the, to quote, the destruction of every ruler and every power. Uh, and Jesus will now be installed or is, is soon to be installed as king, uh, quote, so that the name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend. Mm. Right. Some really potent political stuff that's being wrapped up with this talk of uh, resurrection, at least in its early stages. Um, the, the whole tradition about an empty tomb um, is an interesting one. And I think we're quite, uh, I, I think, it, ambivalent or agnostic, perhaps, on, 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 you know, from a critical historical point of view, um, what we can say with confidence about the tradition of an empty tomb. It actually, it, 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 it may enter the tradition uh, a bit later. Um, we, we only see it coming in in the, in the Gospels. Uh, Paul, if we take Paul's letter to the Corinthians as, as the earlier source talking about the resurrection, Paul seems to simply imagine uh, Jesus being raised and glorified and ascending to heaven. There is not a kind of separate ascension that happens later. Um, rather, Jesus appears to uh, uh, Jesus' associates, um, the raised Jesus appears to Jesus' associates in almost from heaven, as it were. Um, there's the the narrative accounts that we get uh, where Jesus's resurrection appearances are fleshed out a bit more, so to speak, um, uh, come from uh, uh, well uh, the earliest ending of, that we have of Mark doesn't actually have any of these resurrection appearances. It simply ends with an empty tomb, and so we have resurrection stories in uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and John and uh, they're they're completely different. They're expressing this truth or this belief um, uh, in in different ways to to different effects, um, and they're pointing to something that I think is 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 much more interesting and much more um, uh, uh, mysterious than um, you know what could be kind of nailed down in a in a uh, uh, with kind of historical precision. Uh, as it were. So um, it, it, I just wanted to end on, on that point that, you know, for the critical historian, I think this this whole idea of resurrection is is really intriguing and interesting, but we're quite limited in terms of what we can actually, what we can actually say about it, uh, despite it being such, uh, I think, an important question, uh, 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 particularly for those who are interested in, in the, the life of Jesus and uh, particularly those coming from a, a Christian perspective. Mm. Yeah, well, well said. And there's so much more I want to talk to you both about. And I would love to have you back on the show to dive deeper into some of this stuff to talk about, you know, so many different dimensions, even more topical stuff. I really do love the book. I love talking with both of you as a sort of w way to wrap this conversation up. And I, I thank you so much for for your very generous time uh, coming on and spending two hours at this point talking to me about this wonderful book. But as a way to wrap this up, what do you hope people take away from this book? And you can also say anything else you want to say, any last words, etc. I, I mean, it's an interesting question um, because we, we've kind of got two different audiences in a way for this, bo this book. One is historical Jesus scholarship or biblical scholarship as, as we know it. And one is um, a wider, let's just say, left audience or something like this. So it, it's, it, it's trying to bridge those two in a way. And what I hope to do was to uh, for biblical scholars uh well for both really is to see historical materialism in action as something serious uh uh, uh that the whole great man view of history has failed we need to start uh understanding the uh class conflict uh uh understand it seriously not in a vulgar way we need to understand economic context seriously, and we need to understand the connections with those bigger uh, historical pictures that I was talking about before. You know, not just simply uh, a portrait of this figure, but also what are the longer term implications of this figure, unintentional or not. So, um, um, and, and in, always in relation to modes of production, economic context, class conflict, uh, social world, and, and things like this. So as I was hoping that would that would be done, and for a wider left audience is um, is I don't think 
I think there's um, a, v a lot of confusion about religion uh, on the left, certainly in the UK, um, and I'd imagine both in Australia and in, in North America too, um, and, and lots of misunderstandings about it. That, but that this should be an, another normal part of historical research, uh, actually for any historian, whether they're left or not. But if you've from, uh, got materialist Marxist interests or whatever, uh, that this is a serious subject and you've got to take it seriously and there should have been much more of this done before and hopefully there'll be much more of it done in the future. Mm. Amen to that. Robert? I just affirm everything that James just said. I think uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding or, or, or lack of information and misinformation that spread about um, uh, the origins of Christianity and the historical Jesus. On the one hand, you know, we encounter that uh, almost daily because of our, our uh, professional jobs as, as academics working in this field. But equally, uh, you know, I, I do get frustrated uh, at the, you could make the, the, that claim equally about Marxism within uh, uh, contemporary society as well, that there's a lot of disinformation and, and this this kind of bogeyman word of, of Marxism is spread around in a really misinformed way. Um, and frustratingly for us, that's happened quite a bit within the, the field of biblical scholarship itself. Um, and so, you know, uh, that on the one hand, there is that audience that we are talking to, to people who are interested in this kind of material um, and, and showing the, the robustness of a historical materialist take that it doesn't just mean a kind of romanticized lefty Jesus mm -hmm. necessarily, um, um, uh, which which uh, Marxist readings of, of Jesus are often uh, caricatured as. Um, but equally, I think it's to take some of the the, the wealth of uh, uh, research and, and knowledge that we actually have about class conflicts at, in the ancient world and um, uh, and kind of using... The figure of Jesus, the popular and well-known figure of Jesus, to be able to communicate that history of, of class struggle to a broader left audience as well. Those who are wanting to find out something about what life was like um, and what how class and class conflict was experienced in a completely different society to our own, one that at often times will seem uh, strange and unusual, um, and that, you know, not not we're we're not kind of writing a, a programmatic manifesto of um well Jesus did this and so we should do this too i i think the the kind of the dialectical approach that we take to this material and the subject is much more interesting than that it's okay yes there may be some lessons that we might be able to learn from this but it's not um but it, it, it you know this is this is part of that uh, ongoing conversation of the history of class struggles as they inform class struggles today you know we look at this broad sweep of history and we see the movements that have been successful and not been successful and how uh, material conditions um, uh, ha have uh, generated different responses and how we can draw inspiration in in different and sometimes contradictory ways from uh, these movements that have gone before us mm. yeah absolutely and that's why i knew that when i came across that book that the projects that we're engaged in here on Rev Left and this, the podcast that we do outside of Rev Left and your work is very much entangled in that we come from a you know principled and hopefully sophisticated Marxist position, but we take religion seriously. We do episodes on Buddhism, on Islam, on Christianity. We study figures within these movements. We see religion as a terrain of struggle um, that we we can actively engage with. And I think the historical materialist analysis of Jesus' life fits in with that broader project. So the book is Jesus, A Life in Class Conflict. I'll link to it in the show notes. Cannot recommend it more. I highly, highly, highly recommend it to anybody listening. Thank you, James and Robert, so much for not only this wonderful work, but for being so generous with your time, for coming on the show and discussing it at length with me and my audience. I would love to have you back on any time in the future. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank, thank, thank you, Brett. And uh, some, there's some great summaries in there. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And we're better than mine. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You're too kind.